This conference will now be recorded. Thank you, Reverend. All right, we're grateful for our time together today, and we will be in 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verses 1 through uh, 11 today. So we're going to go to open that up, and I want to encourage you. This year we are using the uh, English Standard Version. Uh, next year, we will use the Christian Standard Bible, and I'll explain more later as we walk through this lesson um, um, why we're going to do that, and, and, and you'll see it in particular, especially next week, why we're going to do that, uh, because it is an easier read, and we want people to get an understanding of the Word of God. So let's look at our passage for today. Uh, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is tr true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. All right, so let's go back up to verse one and walk through our presentation. Uh, I want to get to um, talk about John's purposes because one of his purposes in writing this book um, we have to go back and pick up part of chapter one, five through uh, through the end of that chapter. And that is that there was a temptation uh, for John's readers in reading the fact that 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 they would sin uh, to be discouraged or to be cavalier. There are some Christians who treat the fact that we will sin as an inevitability. And because it's an inevitability, Oh, well, it's not a big deal, okay? Uh, there are others who act as if they live above sin. They're so saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost that they no longer sin. And so John is trying to get us to understand the balanced uh, perspective, which is if we sin, we ought to confess and agree with God about our sin. We ought to see it the way he does. And if we do that, then Christ will cleanse us. But his writing to us in this epistle, uh, his purpose in verse two, uh, verse uh, uh, two of chapter two is that we, I mean, verse one of chapter two is that we may not sin, okay? So John is, is, is helping us understand that if we do sin, repentance and confession uh, restore our fellowship with Christ, but we don't have to. And if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So there's some balance here. One is, I need to recognize that sin is not all right, it's deadly. It costs Christ everything. But I also need to recognize that if I do, I shouldn't sink into depression over my sins, but I should speed toward confession, okay? Don't sink toward depression, but speed toward uh, uh, confession. You might want to write that down. Don't sink toward depression, but speed toward confession. 
because when we confess, we have somebody on our side. Anybody have questions about that? All right. So, so John wants us to understand that one of his purposes is that we he does not want his readers to uh, sin at all. Okay, uh, and it is possible because of the power of the Spirit of God that lives in our lives to avoid sin. Okay, but if we do sin, we have an advocate a friend in court, our mediator, uh, Jesus, who defends us, okay? He is our defense attorney that helps us after we have sinned. Uh, because as the old preacher said, uh, he argues on our behalf, but he's talking to his daddy, okay? And he's talking to his daddy, God the Father, on behalf of his brother or sister, which is us. So one of the problems that people have is that they sometimes will sink into depression over their sins and they feel like they're so wretched and miserable and nobody else is as bad as they are. And we should mourn our sins, but don't sink in depression, speed toward confession because your elder brother, your big brother, Jesus is your defense attorney, okay? And that really is the picture that John is laying out uh, for uh, his readers. But he is not only our advocate, he is the propitiation. And this is why I said I wanted to show you something with the uh, Christian Standard Bible. Uh, let me pull this up. Um, the Christian Standard Bible translates this passage a little bit differently. I'm trying to get there it is. There's the Holman Christian Standard, which was done in, 19, in, in 2004, but it's been updated since then to the Christian Standard Bible, okay? Yeah, and so this is one of the reasons why I encourage you, get a Christian Standard Bible, Christian Standard Bible, because it makes the language a little more plain, similar to the NIV, okay? So my little children and I are writing these things so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, not only for ours, but also for the whole world. So the translation atoning sacrifice explains the word propitiation. It makes it simpler. Now, you know, for preaching purposes, it sounds good to be able to throw out those big words, propitiation, but for the purpose of understanding, it's better for us to know that he is the atoning sacrifice, uh, that he makes satisfaction for our sins. He does that as priest, but he is the satisfaction himself as a sacrifice because his body is the place where God executes his wrath against sin, okay? So when Jesus is on the cross, the agony is over the fact that the father is taking out his wrath on the son for our sins, okay? So that's what we mean by atonement, that he has placated uh, the father's wrath, okay? Uh, it provided cleansing. And so that's what we mean by an atoning sacrifice. By the way, what picture in the Old Testament does this point back to? Is it the sacrificial lamb? Yes, it points back to the sacrificial lamb. And on what day? Day of atonement. So the day that Christ died on the cross for us was actually the same day that the high priest would have went in to the sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat in the Old Testament system. It happened during the Passover. We go in, he would sprinkle the blood. Christ's blood satisfies God's wrath because it's an acceptable offering, okay? All right, 
So that's what he means by the propitiation. It's the atoning sacrifice. It's the sacrifice that cleanses um, our sins. Okay. So anybody have a question about that? All right. So because of that, we have fellowship with God. This is the proof of our fellowship. Whoever says I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walks. So the proof of our fellowship is four things. Uh, and there are four principles that preserve or underlie our fellowship. Um, and these all come from these verses. Number one, throughout John, we renounce sin. We confess it. Okay. The second one is right here. We obey God. If we know him, by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Okay. Later on next week, we'll talk about the fact, the next two weeks, that we reject worldliness. Uh, we reject the world system and its temptations that go along with it. And then another is that we keep the faith. We stay faithful in spite of opposition. Uh, so John shares with us throughout the book four principles that underlie fellowship. But the second one is the one we key in on today, and that is that we obey God. We renounce sin, we obey God, we reject worldliness, and we keep the faith. So we're, we're obedient. One of the keys to fellowship, uh, it's a major key, is that we keep his commandments. By this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. So, so one of the, the, the keys of knowing uh, uh, and our millennial, our millennials are, are laughing because they know who that is. But one of the major keys is to keep his commandments. If I want fellowship with him, I need to, I need to be obedient. If I want the fellowship to be right, okay. Um, and so, how, how, how we know? How do we know that we know him? Um, if we keep his commandments, because verse four says. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. Uh, God's word grows and becomes mature in us as we obey him. Okay. And that's why he says, by this we may know that we are in him, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way he walked so the the there are some claims here one of the claims is that i've come to know him and you will see folks say i know the lord well if i know him what's the proof i will keep his word I'll keep his word. If and I the live, way I, the way I live, the way I live. So that's the second one. I abide in him, which means that I'm in relationship with him. We'll explain more about abiding. The 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 proof that I abide in him is I walk like he walked. It's the way we live. And walking in this passage is a figure of speech for lifestyle. So if I claim to know him and I claim to abide in him, then I ought to live like he lived. What's the last one, though? If I say that I'm in the light, which means that I understand God's truth. If I say that I understand God's truth, I'm in the light. What's the what's the condition there? Loving one another. Loving one another. So I can't say I'm in the light and do what? Hate my brother. And hate my brother. OK, so there are three claims. Claim number one is I know him. The condition that satisfies that is I keep his word. Claim number two is I abide in him. I'm in good fellowship with him. The condition for that is I walk like he walks. 
If I'm not walking like he walked, maybe there's an issue in my fellowship. Claim number three is I'm in the light. I understand God's truth. Well, if I understand God's truth, then I ought to do what? Love one another. I ought to love my brother and my sister. Yeah, yeah. So those are the claims of knowing Christ. Anybody need a little more time on that? Uh, Pastor Waddles, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in our group, we wanted to know exa exactly uh, what is meant by worldly, like reject worldliness. What is some examples of worldliness? Y'all needed that in your group? Pardon? <laughs> Did you all want it? <laughs> You needed some examples we of worldliness. Did. Praise the Lord. I'm so well, glad. Well, you know, we, we, we talked about it, but we're not sure if we were, you know, just, just a couple of things. Tell me what you talked about. What 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 did you all surmise? Well, we said that? we said things like um how the world tried to get us to uh do something that we know that is biblically wrong. Yes. And, and then, uh, Go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, we talked about uh, how they try to the things that we know that are the things that we know that are wrong and how the world says that they are right. And sometimes we're persecuted for what we believe and that we know based on the word of God that is wrong. And they try to make it right. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Anybody else want to talk about what worldliness might be? I think in our last study of First Peter, it was so clear what worldliness was. You know, all the things that told us to refrain from, how we should treat one another, uh, how we should treat, you know, and how we should treat God and how we should be faithful. But that was a good study of worldliness. Yes, well, Pastor, I like the way you said, just because it's legal don't mean it's right. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so there are some things that the world says are legal. But as Brother Jordan just said, it doesn't make it right. Is it legal for us to go out and, you know, have sex with anybody we want to? Is that legal? Yes and no. Is it legal? Yes. It's legal. Is it right? No, no. Um, is it legal to hoard money at the expense of others? Pastor, I wanted to say uh, idolism to idolize something. Yeah. You know. How about same sex marriage? Yeah. That's yeah. legal. Right. That's, yeah, that's legal. it's right. Yeah. So the world has its definition of what's legal. And the world has its definition of what's all right. But if it doesn't line up with the word of God, then we have to reject it. And so that's, Sister Taylor, some of those, those things. And I called out specific examples because we tend to shy away from dealing with the real, the real issues, some of which many of us just talked about. Um, but there are some others that we don't consider when it comes to being a Christian like pride or envy or jealousy or hating our brothers or sisters. So John starts taking the time in this passage to unpack specifically what some of those are. So let's let's look at one of them right here. And that is um, that if I'm abiding in Christ, if I have that intimate fellowship with him, uh, I should be obeying God. So abiding in Christ, which we looked at as one of the conditions, one of the claims, I abide in him. That means that I have an intimate relationship with God, that I know God for myself. I've experienced him. I've seen him working in my own life. That's what we mean by knowing God, by abiding in him. So in John 15, when Jesus, and remember, we ask everybody to read John chapter 14, the gospel of John chapter 14 through 17. As we read that, we kept seeing this, this speech about abide in me. And the idea of abiding is having an intimate, close relationship, having fellowship with God, knowing him by experience, okay? 
Uh, my children used to always tell me that they could tell when one of my brothers called me because our, our language is different. How I talk to my brothers, I don't talk to anybody else in the world. There's just a closeness there. And, 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 and they can finish my sentences. Uh, my children can hear my voice when they're talking to uh, their uncles because there's a closeness there. And so the idea is that we abide. We have an intimate fellowship with him. And if we do have that intimate fellowship with him, there are some results. And one of the results is, is that we will keep this old commandment, but we will do it in a new way. Okay. And what is the old commandments that he wants us to keep? Thou shalt love thy, the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, all thy soul, and thy neighbor as thyself. Yes. So it is the loving of God and the loving of our neighbor, of our brother. And so John in particular deals now with the idea that I cannot love God and hate my brother. Okay. It is the obligation of every believer. Uh, that we cannot claim to abide in him, to be in an intimate relationship with him and not act like he acted. So one of, the, one of the results of abiding in Christ is that we love one another, okay? Because whoever hates his brother uh, is still in the darkness, still walking in the darkness, does not understand the truth of God's word. And so the obligation of every believer is that we cannot claim to abide in him unless we behave like him. We cannot claim to have that intimate relationship with the Lord unless we walk like him, unless we operate our lifestyle the way he did. Now to do so is not something that we can accomplish in our own strength, but because of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, we allow Christ to manifest his life in us. His, he empowers us uh, to live like him, okay? Which is why it's important for us to stay in close fellowship with him, okay? And so the old commandment that he gives us is to love one another, okay? And this love is not self-seeking, it's self-sacrificing. Um, um, the proof that I'm a believer of Jesus Christ is that I will love people in a self-sacrificing way. I will seek their best good, okay? Remember that we gave you the definition that Dr. A. Lewis Patterson Jr. taught us, that love is seeking the best good of the object of your affection in the spirit of self-sacrifice, even when you don't feel like it, okay? So uh, real love seeks what's best for someone else. Okay, and so the highest good is the will of God. Therefore, love is doing the will of God. And that's why you see throughout scripture that God is love, okay? Uh, because we love one another with that self-sacrificing love. That's the old commandment that John is referring to, okay? But it finds expression in new ways, okay? One of the sure signs that we are not in fellowship with Christ, not a relationship. It doesn't say that you can't, that you can be, that you're not in relationship with Christ. But if my fellowship with Christ is not right, it is possible for me to hate a fellow Christian. Okay. So one of the sure signs that there's a problem in my fellowship is if I'm hating another believer. Okay. Hatred of other Christians is a sure sign that one is not walking in close fellowship with Christ. Okay, pastor, even though I might get mad at my own brother or get mad at another human being, does that mean I still don't love them? I mean, even though I don't like what they do or maybe like the way they answer me or whatever? Right, but but how do I handle this is the question. Oh, well, shoot, I just blow it off of, you know, <laughs> hey, just overlook it, keep pushing. Yes, and that's the appropriate way. Or I go and sp speak to my brother and sister, Matthew 18, and say, hey, you know, this happened and I didn't like it and you hurt my feelings and I let that person know so that they can repair and apologize 
so that that closeness is maintained. So the, that makes my relationship stay in contact with the Lord. Yeah, but also my brother or sister. Yes. Because my vertical relationship with Christ is tied to my horizontal relationship with my brother or sister. If, okay. if, if you and I have a fallen out and we don't deal with it, it, it impacts our fellowship with Christ because the Holy Spirit is going to be on our case until we get it together. Okay. okay, so my conscience is going to be whooping my tail. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I know that, you know, I, shoot, recently have had that experience where I offended somebody, hurt their feelings, and, you know, had to make it right the best I could. But we, you know, we, we all do that. But for the mm -hmm. believer, that's the norm. The norm is that if we do something like that, we try to make it right. Okay. The world, the world says bump you and your mama too. So, <laughs> so if you know that idea of just breaking fellowship, and I don't care, it's the cancel culture. Skip you, skip your mama, bump all y'all. I ain't gonna have nothing else to do with you. That's mm. not that's not the mindset of the believer. The mindset of the believer is to maintain the relationship and fellowship because we love one another. Amen. So, I'm sorry, that sometimes we get stuck there because we neglect to separate the person from the behavior and it's the person that we always love and it's the behavior that we can sometimes not love but we get them stuck together yeah and so <clears throat> excuse me so we fall out of fellowship and relationship with our brothers or our sisters because we can't separate the person from the wrong behavior yes and sister jackie that is so critical because if i know the person i have certain expectations of their behavior but when their behavior doesn't match my expectations then i might be tempted to treat that person differently and i can love you but not think that your actions are appropriate as a matter of fact sometimes when there are people whose actions are not appropriate it's best for us as my granny used to say, to love them with the long handle spoon. I'm gonna make the relationship right. right. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna make the relationship right on my end. If you choose not to reciprocate, there's nothing I can do about that. But I love you, and I'm not gonna keep punishing you uh, for whatever happened. And so that's you know that's important that we be able to separate the behavior from the person. But if the person's behavior uh, continues a negative pattern. Uh, sometimes we have to make a decision about whether or not we expose ourselves to that because forgiveness is not allowing ourselves to be run over over and over again but forgiveness is refusing to punish the person um, and to keep bringing it up so those are uh, important nuances there okay Pastor, yes sir could i flip it to like the other side say like uh if you see God is blessing someone, that there's envy or jealousy that could stop your relationship and love for that person because uh, what's happened to them and it's not happening to you, you know, how would you straighten yourself out on that and ask for forgiveness from the Lord or whatever? That way, could it, could that be one of the ways too? Far yes, out of absolutely. Stuff? Because sometimes the source of hatred is jealousy. I see how the Lord has blessed this person. Yes. I see how things are happening in their life and it's not happening in mine. And so I, people try to tear down other people because of that. But that's a sign of immaturity and it's a sign of disruptive fellowship because it is also a sign of false pride because that says that I deserve better than how the Lord has blessed me. Well, Pastor, I'm, I'm scared to share my testimony just over that reason. Why is that, brother? over other people you know looking at that looking at me different because i'm being blessed and they're not yeah but don't worry about that because you you're not the source of blessing and if True. you know if you know that it came from the lord and it wasn't something that you produced yourself and you give him credit he gets the glory that's now, it your testimony of being faithful to god and god blessing is an encouragement to others who may be struggling in their True. relationship and fellowship with Christ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So 
one of the sure signs that we're not walking with Christ that we hate other people. But it doesn't just hurt them, it hurts, it hurts us. If we're the person that hates our fellow believer, there are some results. One is it places that person outside of God's fellowship. The relationship is not broken, but the fellowship is affected. Let me fix something real quick. I'm sorry, y'all. This is the perfectionist in me. Uh, the relationship is not affected, but the fellowship is. Okay? Uh, and somebody else saw that and was hoping I was going to fix it. So there it is. Uh, the fellowship is disrupted with the Lord. Okay? Secondly, it leads to aimless activity in which he or she is in great spiritual danger and in which there's a possibility of a fall. So let's go to John chapter 9, verse 41. John chapter 9, verse 41. Okay. Uh, um, the Pharisees who are near him say these, hear these things, and Jesus is explaining to them that they are blind. Um, and he has, he has said to them, um, he, he's healed a man that was born blind. And he explained to the man that, that Jesus is the one that has healed him. He'd never seen Jesus, even though Jesus had healed him. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now what you say, now that you say, we see your guilt remains. And so the issue there was that because they were not in fellowship with Christ, they were in, in great spiritual danger. Now, let me talk about this aimless activity. You've seen people who spend their time trying to tear down other people, who work against other people, who if somebody is uh, doing this, they're going to do that. If somebody is voting this way, they're going to vote that way. If they think you're going this way, they're going to go that way. And they obsess over punishing other folk, okay? Um, um, and so there's this constant wasting of time because they're worried about their enemy, okay? Something else that can happen is if a person stays in that condition too long, John 12, 35 shows us it can result in mental confusion, okay? Um, um, John 12, 35. So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. Walk while you have the light. Believe in the light that you may have sons of light. The darkness can overtake those, uh, a lack of understanding. And so you see people operate and do crazy stuff that doesn't make any sense because uh, they have allowed their hate to consume them, okay? It's a dangerous thing. Anybody have questions about that? Would that also apply to someone or um... To in to when you're in a meeting or when you're in a group and you're trying to push forward with new ideals and people are constantly throwing back, well, that's not the way it's done and that's not what we've done in the past and um, things of that nature. Well, that that is the result sometimes of a lack of uncomfortability and a lack of understanding. Now, some of that has to do with trust and love because if I trust and love then i'll be willing to listen and learn but if i haven't developed that trust and love then i may reject and close my ears to what's being presented and that often especially since we're talking about what we see in churches is the fact that there's two parts of that one is that leadership must be patient enough to grow and develop that trusting relationship and be respectful enough uh, to do that. The second part is that uh, fellowship uh, must take place so that people grow that relationship so that they trust the vision. 
Um, Deacon Reeves and I talk about this often, uh, that one of the reasons why it's important for, uh, for leadership to spend time together is because when the Lord challenges us to move, because that relationship is there, we can move out, okay? Uh, but if the relationship is not there, the church will be plagued by inefficiency. And so um, uh, relational issues often stymie progress because we don't trust people enough to walk with them. But when we have developed our relationship with Christ and one another, uh, then we're able to move more quickly uh, because God is blessing us to do that. Go ahead. Pastor, wouldn't that like walking together with each other and getting to know each other will come in the form that where if one of the other members can't make it to a meeting or can't do their project by me knowing them and having a relationship with them, I can step in and catch their back? Yes. <laughs> Like Monday, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on somebody right now. Sunday, some of y'all don't know, but I had a horrible allergic reaction and wound up in the ER. Face broke out, I had hives all over my body and it was getting into my eyes and really starting to get into my throat and it was getting a little bit dangerous. And so I had to go get treated, all kind of stuff they gave me to deal with that. And I'm still taking things today. I texted a few key people and said, listen, I'm not going to be there Monday. But I always try to work the food pantry because it's important and I want, you know, things to go well. Deacon Reeves showed up and was the ram in the bush for me uh, Monday. And I'm not holding him up as a paragon of virtue, but I love the brother and I appreciate the fact that he knew I couldn't be there, so he stepped in. And brother Mark, that's exactly right. If I care for my brother or sister and I know they can't do something that I can do, I ought to be willing to step in and help because that's a sign of love if somebody's unable. Uh, and so that's that's that relational thing, uh, you know, and it makes the body of Christ operate more smoothly because the Lord allows our gifts to work together. Um, and so that's 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 one of the beautiful things about it. Um, so uh, last point, and then we're going to get to our questions. Penalty of living in darkness, uh, which means not walking in the truth of Christ, is not merely that one does not see, but that one goes blind. And so if I keep ignoring God's truth, I keep rejecting God's truth, I refuse to see what God wants me to see. It can be that eventually I'm unable to see what the Lord wants me to see. I'm still in relationship with him. I'm still his child, but I need, I constantly need somebody else to hold me by my hand and lead me because I'm not walking in fellowship. And one of the, one of the, one of the signs of this is not being able to follow any direction that comes from the Lord or his uh, leadership is I'm bucking everything and I'm bumping into everything. Okay. Uh, and over time, if a person is that obstinate and hard-headed, they can go spiritually blind. They lack direction. They cannot see. They don't know what to do uh, because they're not plugged into how the Lord is leading. Okay. All right. Questions. It can happen to leaders too. Don't 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 be mistaken. It can happen to pastors. It can happen to deacons. It can happen to anybody who's who's in a in a capacity of responsibility. Uh, because I've allowed sin to take over. Okay. All right, questions. Pastor, what is the difference between not walking in fellowship and walking in sin? Well, walking in sin yes. and not walking in fellowship go hand in hand because sin disrupts the fellowship. So let's go back to something real quick. I'm glad you asked me that because there's a parallel that John draws. So if we go to 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So that's the that this disrupts our relationship with Christ because this person has to confess Christ. Okay, but look at the next piece down here. Whoever says I know him but, not, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Same language. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way he walked. Well, then the very next thing he starts talking about is how we love one another. So when you look at this word liar, the liar does not confess Christ, but the liar also does not maintain fellowship. So that's the relationship. Sin, uh, unconfessed sin, prevents us from having a relationship with Christ. Okay, but on uh, when I don't deal with my relational issues with people, then it keeps me from being in good fellowship with them and the Lord. So there's 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 the confession, and remember we talked last week about two types of confession. Uh, there's the uh, salvific confession or salvational confession, which leads me into relationship conversion. Uh, confession, but then there's also the relational confession that keeps me in fellowship, and that helps me maintain good relationships uh, with the Lord and others. Okay. All right. Other questions? All right. Well, let's get into our questions then. Uh, question number one, why had John written this epistle? What was one of his reasons? To have a better relationship with Jesus Christ and learn how to walk with him and be obedient and yes, being sir. able to confess and, and, and uh, repent our sins. Right. Yes. He writes so that they will not sin um absolutely okay outstanding question two according to dr constable's notes on uh the first epistle of john on page 30 through 31 what is an advocate and what does an advocate do advocate is another word for the player key or someone who stands beside me and, and speaks on my behalf to whoever is is uh whoever he needs to speak to on my behalf. Yes, sir. It's it's Jesus speaking to his, like you said to his dad. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, brother. And so the advocate speaks on our behalf. They stand right next to us. And uh it's like having a defense attorney. Okay. Question three. Uh, on page 31 through 32 of Dr. Constable notes, how is Jesus the propitiation for our sins, especially his body? The blood. He shed his blood for our sins. All right. So what he is paid, it? He paid the penalty. He went to the cross for all of us and everything that we do wrong, even today, the past and present. Yes, sir. So he pays the price with his body, with his blood. Yeah. All right. Anybody want to add anything to that? He satisfied the wrath of God. He satisfies the wrath of God. And that's one of the reasons why we ought to recognize that sin is so deadly because it requires satisfaction. And the Lord knows we couldn't pay. That's why the songwriter writes, what a debt I owe because Christ paid for us, okay? Uh, all right, so we had a little fill in the blank here. I'm trying to switch it up on y'all. Uh, Jesus's death not only expiated what? He canceled, dismissed, and waived our sins. Jesus' death not only expiated, but it canceled. Did what else? Dismissed. Dismissed and? waived and waived our sins but it provided cleansing cleansing from their defilement and satisfied god's wrath 
satisfied God's wrath against sin with and what? Acceptable offering. With an acceptable offering. That's on page 32. An acceptable Miss Smith. <laughs> if you need to get the masses, call Sister Smith. That's Dean Smith. She's got it. Okay. Uh, that was right on page 32 in the notes. All right. Question five. What are the four fundamental principles that underline fellowship with God? Four fundamental principles. Renounce sin, obey God, reject worldliness, and keep the faith. All right. Thank you, Sister Taylor. Renounce sin, obey God. What was number three? Reject worldliness. Reject worldliness and keep the faith. Keep the faith. Okay. Uh, and you'll see a parallel to that next week. Okay. Question six. Does anybody need Sister Taylor to repeat those again for question five? Also, live in the light of God's presence. Live in the light of God's presence was was a fifth bonus answer. I didn't ask for that one, but it's there. Live right. in the light of God's presence. And that means that I walk in an understanding of his word that informs my relationship with him. Okay, question six. In verse three, what is the evidence that we know that we have an intimate connection with Christ? That we keep his commandments. That we keep his commandments. That we keep his commandments. All right, question I want to say my relationship that I have with him. How I'm uh, always talking to him. How I'm like, uh, what word am I? My, my prayers is constantly, you know, I mean, I'm all, my mind is always on him. If I ain't by myself, I'm talking to him, so. That's that intimate know. connection, brother. That's exactly the way it's supposed to be. You remember that old song? And this might be a little too trite, but that old song, Intimate Friends, uh, and Endless Love, I found in you, warm and exciting and everything we do, uh, two hearts together as one. That's, that's, Eddie Kendricks is talking about his relationship with a woman, but the reality is that that's how our relationship with Christ ought to be. He ought to be on our mind. We ought to be talking with him. It ought, to, it ought, it ought to be just that close. Yeah. And listen, let me say this to us. If we get that relationship right, the other ones will work out. Uh, sometimes the reason the other ones don't is because we're still working on that, that primary relationship that comes with Christ. But that intimate connection. Um, I woke up this morning early before my alarm clock went on. And just had a time of prayer all by myself. And then I fell back to sleep until the alarm clock <laughs> told me it was time to get up. Uh, but but just starting the day with Christ, that's one of the reasons why we start our prayer call. It's because I don't want other stuff to get in my mind and distract before we can move on. Amen. Right. So we had some fill in the blanks here. So claim number one is I have come to know him. What's the condition? He keeps his word. He keeps his word. This is on page 36. He keeps his word. Brother Ellis, go ahead and take the next piece. What's the next claim? I abide in him. I abide in him. The condition is that I walk as he walked. And then go ahead and do the last one for us. Uh, I am in the light. And the condition is he loves his brother. He loves his brother, okay? He loves his brother. So the first claim is I've come to know him. If I've come to know him, the condition is? He keeps his word. I keep his word. I the keep second, his word. Mm -hmm. I keep his word, yeah. The second one is what again? I abide in him. I abide in him. And if I abide in him, then I? I walk as he walked. And then the third one is that I'm in the light. And if mm -hmm. I'm in the light, then what's the, th what's the third condition? Then I love my brother or sister. Then I love my brother or sister, yeah. 
If someone is a brother, the things I'll do for them, I might not do for somebody else because we're in a relationship together. Okay. All right. Question eight. Question eight. What does it mean to abide in Christ? I said, first of all, we have to believe that he is. And we have to believe in his power to keep it the same. And we have to fellowship with him in prayer and the word in meditation. All right. All right. Anyone want to add on to that one? Uh, I also had that it also means to to know God through experience. Experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it is that I know him but I know him experientially. I've had some things happen. I've seen him do some things. We've been walking together and I've, I've looked at his word and now I know how to recognize his operation in my life. I've had some experience with him. Yeah, abiding is that experiential knowledge. Yeah. Uh, all right, question nine. What is the obligation of every believer? To be obedient to his word. To be obedient to his word. What else? To walk as Jesus. To love one walked. another. To walk as Jesus walked. To love one another. Those three things are synonymous. Being obedient to his word, walking as Jesus walked, and loving one another. Those three things go hand in hand. Okay. All right, question 10. What is the old commandment of which John spoke in verse 7? To love one another. To love one another. All right. Question 11. And what is a sure sign that one is not walking with God in close fellowship? If we hate our brother. If we hate our brother. Okay. And then it says to fail to show love is to demonstrate hate. To fail, Lord have mercy, Sister Cheryl. To fail to show love is to demonstrate hate. If a person needs us and we refuse to come to their aid, uh, that's a form of hatred. Lord have mercy. All right, question 12. What? How does the hater's sin affect him or her in three ways? What does it do? It uh, places him in darkness outside of God's fellowship. Uh, there's uh, aimless activity in, in which uh, he is in spirit, uh, great spiritual danger and uh, it produces mental confusion. All right, so there are three effects. One is it disrupts my fellowship. Two, I wind up in aimless activity. And then three, it results in mental confusion. Isn't Listen. he blinded from the truth? And he is blinded from the truth. And that was the next one. I, the penalty of living in darkness okay. is being blinded from the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Hatred is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It affects the one that carries it more than it does. Because listen, you probably have had this ex experience. If you haven't, keep leaving for Jesus. There are folk that will hate you because of your, your Christian walk and how the Lord blesses you and you just happy in Jesus' name and you won't even know it. You heard my statement, what I'm scared to share. Yeah. Well, brother, listen. Dust your shoulders off, keep moving. Okay. Because you cannot control how other people feel. And then here's, here's another powerful thing, powerful lesson I learned. And I learned this from working in the school system. If you allow what other people do to say, well, if you allow what other people say or do to change how you feel, you've given them power over you. If you allow That's what true. other people say That's or do true. to change how you feel or, or behave, you've given them power over you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, some of us have experienced so much of that that we are cautious about what we do all the time. But I want to encourage us to live a bold, joyful life 
And those folks can just kick rocks if they have to, because I'm not going to oh. change. I'm not going to change my behavior and my joy because somebody else got their jaws tight all the time. And that bold, joyful life. Bold, <laughs> life. Sister Kimball, go ahead. That's what I was going to say. I said, you know, abiding in him. I just think about always resting in him. And I try to model my life after Christ. And that gives me joy. It gives me joy in following in God's footsteps. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's beautiful. Joy. Right. Anybody have uh, other comments, questions? Uh, Pastor Bartles, uh, you uh, cited a, a song this, this morning and this afternoon. And uh, when I was studying uh, for this class, I, uh, I mean, was looking at darkness and I was thinking about the uh, slippery slope between darkness or between fellowship and darkness or between uh, good and bad. And, and uh, I, I was reminded of a song from a, my, from a long time ago that you probably, you only would know it as a oldie but goodie, but yeah. I was there when it brought it out. And, it, and the songwriter said, I was slipping into darkness when I heard my mother say, you've been slipping into darkness pretty soon you've got to pay. So I, I did, that song kept going over in my mind. Like I yeah. say, you know what is a goodie but goodie, but, but I was there when they sang it. So uh, it's uh, it just we have to be careful because it's, it is a slope between goodness and, and darkness, and we and we can slip into it and not even know it. Yes, sir. Well, no, yes, when we sir. get there, we don't know we're slipping sometimes. Yes, sir. That's powerful. That's powerful. Thank you. Well, that man, he's showing his age. <laughs> That's my big brother. That's my uncle Maurice. <laughs> Yeah. Living in the darkness. Yeah. And so the truth is, it's critical that we watch our footsteps. That's why the Bible says your word is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. Because the enemy makes it easy for us to get diverted into darkness. And so we have to stay focused so that we don't. All right. Well, listen, uh, I want to thank everybody for sharing with us in our study today. Uh, we're going to stop our recording at this time.